Welcome to this video on the top 10 ghouls from the tabletop role-playing game Vampire the Masquerade. Ghouls are a tricky subject for vampires. Technically their very existence is a violation of the masquerade, as ghouls remain mortal but possess knowledge of the existence of vampires. But ghouls are incredibly useful to their domitors, or regnants if you prefer. They can do all sorts of things between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. that vampires can't, without catching a sudden and fatal case of sunburn that no amount of aloe vera will fix. The downside is that many ghouls, especially those who are weak-willed, tend towards emotional or mental instability, as demonstrated by the notoriously sanguinary and insane ghoul, R.M. Renfield, which tends to diminish their utility, and the very point of having a ghoul in the first place. But without further ado, the top 10 ghouls. Number 10, the Master of Servants. Cain's curse did not extend only to his damned progeny. He was acutely aware of the vulnerability of his kind and that he would require a servant who could do his bidding during the day, but whose loyalty would be assured. This man would be Cain's first and possibly only ghoul, the Master of Servants, possibly named Jubal, this original ghoul enjoyed unique status in the first city as he was considered an equal of the third generation. And given the potency of Cain's blood, this is not difficult to imagine. As Cain's chief mortal agent, he also held dominion over all other ghouls, mortals, and slaves of the first city. The fate of the master of servants following the deluge is unknown. A ghoul requires the same sustenance as any other mortal. However, the Master of Servants was noted to have had most of his blood replaced by Cain's, and with access to such power, who knows what such a man could endure, or accomplish. The Gangrel archaeologist Beckett, through his journeys and collection of Nodis fragments and rumors, came to suspect that the first ghoul might still exist in Egypt, sequestered in a hidden temple, and in possession of a large quantity of Cain's blood, which he uses to prolong his existence. If this is true, then the Master of Servants might be the greatest source of information on the first city and Cain himself remaining in the world. Number 9. Hakim Vampires tend to use their ghouls for practical purposes. If the emotions invoked by the Blood Oath make the ghoul a more loyal and effective servant, more's the better. In the 5th century, an Asimite warrior, in the classic manner of his clan, took a mortal as his ghoul and protege. But the Asimites selected the ghoul for a particular reason. This mortal had the gift of true sight. He could penetrate any disguise or illusion and strike down his victims with terrifying precision. For two centuries, the ghoul served his Asimite master until the vampire fell in battle during a campaign against the Bali. Death shatters the blood bond, sometimes with unpredictable effects. In the case of the ghoul, the shattering of the blood bond also affected his mind blending the teachings of the clan with his own fractured psyche until he came to the conclusion that he was not a servant of Hakim, he was Hakim himself. The false Hakim, as he came to be known to clan Asimite, used his two centuries of experience hunting and assassinating to cut down countless mortals, at least a dozen Asimites, and an unknown number of vampires of other clans. His philosophy, which he handed down to his own followers, was one of one man, one knife, one strike. This was not only how he assassinated mortals, but his strategy of ambushing and staking vampires to extend his own life. In the 11th century, the false Hakim heard of the assassins in their curiously named Persian fortress called Alamut. Since he was, in his own mind, Hakim, Alamut was his natural seat. The false Hakim became a shadowy figure within the order of assassins, a man whose power was felt rather than seen. While safely ensconced within the mortal Alamut, the false Hakim began recruiting other mortals like him who possessed true sight to train them in assassination and tempt them with eternal life, squeezed from the veins of Cainites. Despite their best attempts to slay the false Hakim for his heresy, the Asimites could not help but note the effectiveness of his terror campaigns against Christians, Muslims, and even other vampires. Though they would never credit such a man for adding to their arsenal, the Asimites of the Dark Ages adopted the tactics of the Assassins and of the False Hakim to use in their own wars against the Canaanite Crusaders of Europe. The fate of the False Hakim is unknown, 
following the final destruction of the mortal Alamut by the Mongols in 1275 AD. Number 8. Niccolo Giovanni Niccolo Giovanni was a ghoul of the Giovanni family in the Dark Ages, when the family was still subordinate to the true clan of death, the Cappadocians. Niccolo was the retainer, and possibly mortal nephew, of Augustus Giovanni, which would explain why he was given the important task of locating fragments of the Book of Nod for his domitor. In 1197 AD, Niccolo heard rumors of the possible existence of a trove of Nodist fragments in the mountains of central Anatolia. In the Persian city of Tabriz, Niccolo encountered a scholar of the Bruja, who confirmed that the fragment existed, but that all those who went in search of it either never returned, or returned with no memory of where they had been, or how they had come back. While entering into a temporary service to a Ventru, Niccolo was tasked with organizing and cataloging the contents of her vaults. There, Niccolo found the location of the fragment of the Book of Nod, a place in Cappadocia called the Monastery of Shadows, or Erkias. The Monastery of Shadows was aptly named as it had been built in a narrow valley of granite that only received a few hours of sunlight each day. The abbot of the monastery greeted Niccolo and welcomed him to transcribe what he wished from their libraries, and the library of Erechias was a wonder to behold. Niccolo understood how some of his kind had accidentally crumbled to dust, lost in the treasures of antiquity. He searched the library for four nights until, on September 28, 1197, he found the Book of Nod, or rather, it found him. A chill breeze that could not have been possible in the windowless repository led Niccolo to a hidden room behind a shelf of scrolls. The room, in truth a cave in the mountain around which the Monastery of Shadows had been built, held a table of the same granite as the rest of the mountain. And on that table, bound in a wide folder of tanned human skin, was a complete chapter of the Book of Nod, possibly scribed by Cain himself. Niccolo set to work copying and transcribing the text, one original and another in Italian. After the second night of copying, Niccolo noticed something had changed in the vault containing the book. There was another one, a second chapter, bound anthropodermically, like the first, telling the story of how Cain had been banished to Nod, his dalliance with Lilith, and his rejection of Heaven's will. But the only footsteps in the cavern's dust were his own. For over two weeks, Niccolo Giovanni proceeded as though he were in a dream, or perhaps a nightmare. The books were all consuming, and more appeared, eight in total. Yet with each new book, his paranoia and dread deepened. He could feel eyes upon him, hear disembodied whispers in his waking hours and in his dreams, and saw shadows moving just at the edge of his sight. As he transcribed the eighth volume, he saw a prophecy that chilled him to his bones, that a grandchild of Cain, one who sought after knowledge, but was drunk on dreams of death and shadows, would be betrayed by his own. The next night, Niccolo went to the secret cave only to find the wall sealed fast against his entry. In fact, it was as if no passage had ever been there. The ghoul scholar carefully packed away his vellum copies in oilcloth, along with his notes and personal letters, and prepared to return home to Venice. However, he never would. Malachi, abbot of the Brotherhood of Shadows, sent a letter, along with Niccolo's personal effects, to Augustus Giovanni, offering his condolences about the ghoul scholar's demise, along with an epitaph about the propensity of the young to chase after things without heed to the peril that they might suffer. Niccolo Giovanni's translation, later known colloquially as the Erechias Fragments, would pass into Nodist circles as a much coveted, studied, and debated piece of Nodist Apocrypha. Number 7. Pierre Guedot Pierre was born in 1766 in France. He would have lived and died as a poor but happy peasant farmer with his wife and son, but in 1788 a famine swept through France. Pierre's wife and son, already weakened by hunger, perished from fever. He blamed himself for failing his family, for failing to provide for and protect them. Indeed, he believed that he had murdered them by his failure to secure food. As he took his family to the churchyard for burial in the cold of winter, his broken down cart traveled on the same road in the opposite direction as his feudal lord, Duke Manette, who owned his village, 
his land, and his people. The Duke's coachman ordered Pierre to move his cart off the road to make room for the Duke's lavish carriage. By the time Pierre coaxed his nag and the wagon off the road, and the Duke's carriage had passed, he lost feeling in his feet, as his shoes were rags. By the time Pierre's wife and son were buried in a mass grave along with other victims, four of his toes were lost to frostbite. But his heart burned with new hatred for Duke Manette and all like him. Once he healed from the amputation of his toes, Pierre traveled to Paris to look for work. But there were more unemployed poor in Paris than there had been in his home village. But he found other like-minded people who shared his hatred of the nobility. When the French Revolution erupted, Pierre had found his calling as one of its most enthusiastic killers. Though Pierre never made it into the history books, he was a prolific executioner of the Republic, claiming at least 20 heads a day. As his body count rose, he attracted the attention of another killer of the undead variety, the Toreador Diablerist, Madame Gilles. Gilles made Pierre her ghoul and dispatched him as a spy to identify the elders who still hid among the former aristocracy so that they might taste revolutionary justice. Pierre Godot has followed his mistress for over two centuries, honing his abilities to observe and kill without warning. In the modern nights, Pierre is Madame Gilles' personal executioner and torturer. His preferred method of dealing with vampires is to drain them of their blood, then bury them, so that rot claims their bodies and insanity claims their minds. Number 6. Kaspar Bratovich The Bratovich family is a long-serving revenant family of the Zemitsi, and unfortunately it tends to show in their members. They are also extremely widespread. Some of that Bratovich blood landed in the soil of the state of Arkansas, producing a branch family of inbred, cannibalistic sadists who also happen to be some of the finest breeders of warhounds in the Sabbat. Kaspar Bratovich was born into this psychotic family and thrived. As an infant, Kaspar's sense of smell was superior to even the Bratovich hunting dogs, as demonstrated when he helped his father, Clem, hunt down and catch a group of hapless backpackers who trespassed on the family land. When Clem presented the toddler with one of the backpackers' severed head as a reward, Kaspar jammed his little fingers into the eye socket, popped out an eye, and stuck it in his mouth. Clem, filled with fatherly pride, rubbed his son on the head and said, that's my boy. As Kaspar grew older, slowly since Revenant's age at a third of the rate of ordinary mortals, he mastered vicissitude quickly and applied his skills to some of the Brodovich hounds. His favorite was a hellhound easily the size of a large man, made of pure muscle and with bone spurs sticking out of its head, neck, and back. If Kaspar loved anything in the world, it was that dog, who he named Muffin. But one night, a sleek black helicopter landed on the Brodovich land, right in the front yard. Out of it stepped one of the most feared members of Clan Zemitsi, the Voivode of Voivodes, Lord Vladimir Rustovic, who had been a Brodovich revenant during his own life. Rustovic had come to take possession of his hellhound, Muffin, as per an agreement with Clem. Kaspar thought he would complain about losing his beloved pet. Instead, he said, within the hearing of the Zemitsi warlord, that he wanted to be just like him when he grew up. Rustovic turned his gaze on the young revenant, the eyes of a vampire who had slaughtered countless mortals, vampires, and lupines without a shred of pity. However, the voivode's look was one of amusement. You are an interesting young man, Rustovic said. We will meet again. And then, Vladimir Rustovic left Arkansas forever, with Muffin. The next night, Kaspar Brodovich ran away from his home to seek his destiny, to become a Zemitsi, and preferably, the child of Vladimir Rustovic. Years of wandering taught Kaspar how to recognize and track vampires by scent. He eventually ended up in Greece, where he caught the scent of vampires in the countryside of Thessaly. The vampire was protected by guards and canines, but Kaspar evaded this pitiful security with ease. It was only when he encountered a magical trap laid by the sorcerers of the Orphic Circle that he was discovered. The Circle's ruling body, the Ebon Bench, was so impressed by the 30-year-old Revenant, who appeared to be a 10-year-old boy thanks to his slow aging, that he was offered membership in the Orphic Circle. Within five years, he became leader of the Circle's cadre of hunters, 
as well as Chief of Security for Teneris, the Circle's headquarters, a fitting job considering the ease with which he had defeated much of its security. Kaspar took up breeding hounds for the Orphic Circle, who could detect the presence of wraiths, and took them to the lower caverns of Teneris to hunt specters. One specter in particular, a Mort White, has taken to playing a game of cat and mouse with Kaspar in the caves. This Mort White is noteworthy for the death wounds on his corpus, a slashed neck, a missing eye, and tiny baby teeth marks scarring his horrific face. Kaspar might even recognize this Mort White should they ever meet face to face. Number 5. Pablo Salamanca y Grimaldi The Salamanca family is a cadet branch of the Grimaldi family of Zamitzi Revenants and one of the wealthiest in Latin America. Despite their positions of power, they know that they are little more than the Sabat's errand boys. But on the plus side, so long as they grovel to their betters and clean up the worst of their messes and deliver the cash that the sect requires, the Salamancas are free to do whatever they want to whoever they want in Mexico. Pablo was born in the early 20th century to Ernesto Rivera Salamanca and Francesca Grimaldi, his eighth wife and third cousin. Francesca was an Italian import to add a little fresh blood to the Salamanca breeding stock. Ernesto, however, decided that these hoes are not in fact for everybody and kept Francesca as his exclusive concubine. But when Francesca protested her captivity, Ernesto did what any reasonable Zamitzi revenant would. He tore out her tongue and both of her eyes. That she died giving birth to Pablo, Ernesto's only son, was her last act of defiance against him. Pablo saw his father and uncles ruthlessly build the Salamanca's financial empire with bribes, promises, and threats, bending the ears of presidents and generals willing to enrich themselves by selling out their people. When Pablo reached manhood, Rafaela La Paz, the Zamitzi tender of the Salamanca bloodline, made him her personal thrall. He served his mistress well as her ghoul until September 19, 1985, when a magnitude 8 earthquake struck Mexico City and the surrounding area. Thousands died, including Ernesto, but Pablo was only concerned for one person in particular, Rafaela. He rushed to his mistress's haven, which had largely collapsed. He found her huddled in the last shady corner covered by a weak bit of masonry, the last sight Pablo saw of the perfect monster that he had worshipped for decades was her cowering and then screaming as she burst into flames and melted under the sun's cleansing light. As the blood bond in his veins shattered, he saw her with clear eyes for the first time. She had been nothing but a weakling, hiding in the shadows, like all of her kind. And in that moment, he became aware of just how abominable his slavery to the Sabbat had been. With the death of Ernesto Salamanca, Pablo Salamanca y Grimaldi became president of El Grupo Salamanca, a very large and complex financial and legal services company, which is also a front for the Sabbat in Mexico. But few of the Sword of Cain have cared to recognize a disturbing pattern in the blood-soaked sect. For nearly two decades, domitors of the Grimaldi revenants have had the unusual habit of meeting final death, whether it was through poorly conceived attacks on Los Angeles, monomacy duels, or fire dances. By the turn of the century, Pablo approached a century in age, a point at which he would be dependent on frequent infusions of canine vita just to survive. However, he had no interest in being bloodbound to another vampire ever again. To solve this problem, he created a network of trusted Salamanca and Grimaldi family members who kidnapped vampires, preferably anarchs and fledglings, staked them, and transported them to Mexico for the family to feed from and then destroy. Even if his prey managed to escape from the family, they wouldn't escape or survive the Sabbat of Mexico. Pablo Salamanca y Grimaldi's efforts to free his family from Sabbat domination may be complicated by the ancient and perceptive La Sombra, Eliezer de Polanco, an emissary of the newly minted Archbishop, Lucita de Aragon. But Pablo has a trump card in his back pocket, the regent of the Sabbat, Melinda Galbraith, or rather, the imposter pretending to be Melinda Galbraith. Pablo was present at the Palo Grande in 2000, where he had a meeting with Galbraith, both to discuss financial matters and to indulge the regent in her perverse hobby of parodying mortal sex. Instead of meeting with him, the regent ignored him. 
Pablo spent months investigating the regent's sudden change of attitude and concluded that the regent was not, in fact, Melinda Galbraith. It was someone younger and not very smart. Pablo has since utilized resources to protect Zachary Sikorsky from discovery as a weak Sabat regent is useful to him, and he suspects that the real Melinda Galbraith may still be out there. Number 4. Rania. Rania of the Dahabi family has a great deal of misfortune. First, her family. For those vampires with a keen understanding of history and infernalism, the Dahabi are infamous for their servitude to the Bali Methuselah, Nurgle, who used them as his priests and assassins. Shaitan Nurgle also infested the family with a penchant for weak-willed degeneracy and infernalism. Rania was born into the Turkish branch of the family and was no different. While she had an encyclopedic knowledge of ancient and dead languages, which facilitated her career as a mercenary scholar, she was also an enthusiastic infernalist and auto-cannibal, having eaten two of her own fingers and one of her earlobes. The Gangrel archaeologist Beckett hired Rania to deliver artifacts he required from the Cappadocian underground city of Kaimakli to his mentor, Aristotle de Laurent, with the understanding that Aristotle would kill her once the artifacts were in his possession. Instead, Aristotle used Rania as a red herring so that he could keep one particular artifact of importance for himself. He then sent her to Montreal, where a pack of Sabat Nada scholars, the librarians, were waiting to receive her. In exchange for translating the text from the Shroud of Nod for them, the librarians were to keep Rania hidden from Beckett, who wanted his stuff back, and from the Sabat Inquisition, which wanted to destroy the librarian's pack, and would use Rania, an infernalist ghoul, as the perfect pretext to do so. But one librarian, Christanius Lionel, stole the Shroud of Nod and kidnapped Rania, throwing the city of Montreal into chaos, and rumors of what he stole spread. The conflict pitted the powerful Sabat Inquisition against one of the most respected Sabat packs in North America, the Shepherds of Cain. Rania disappears from the annals of Cainite history here. It is unknown whose purpose she served by the end. Number 3. Caiaphas Smith. Caiaphas Smith is perhaps the single deadliest vampire hunter on earth. He was born in 1815 in New England. At the age of 15, the pious young man slew his first vampire. Before his father went away to Boston for business, he instructed the young Caiaphas to assist their neighbor, Goodwife Clayton, with her cows. The good wife had recently taken ill, and the local doctor's best efforts could not cure her. Caiaphas arrived at her farm at sunset. As he was about to knock on her door, the young man saw Goodwife Clayton with a stranger, apparently being fondled by him. Caiaphas burst through the door to urge Goodwife Clayton to remember her virtue and not be tempted into the sin of fornication with this man. The man turned to face Caiaphas as Goodwife Clayton went limp in his grasp, her blood dripping from his lips and chin. Caiaphas instantly knew who, or rather what, stood before him. One of the damned, a blood drinker, a vampire. The vampire locked eyes with Caiaphas, seeking to sap his will with its infernal power. Caiaphas knew that if he faltered, he would share the same fate as Goodwife Clayton. He shut his eyes, turned, and fled from the house. The vampire quickly gave chase. Caiaphas ran as fast as his legs could carry him to the Clayton shed to find a weapon of some kind. With only seconds between him and his pursuer, Caiaphas grabbed a hoe, broke the shaft over his thigh, and plunged it into the heart of the charging vampire. The vampire fell on the ground with a scream, held perfectly still by the makeshift stake protruding from its chest. Only its eyes could follow the young man as he rooted around in the shed, again, this time emerging with an axe. For the last time in its existence, the vampire felt fear as Caiaphas Smith raised the axe over his head and brought the blade down on the vampire's neck. For 170 years, Caiaphas Smith has waged a one-man war against vampires. He apprenticed for a time under a veteran witch hunter named Daniel Hargrave, from whom he learned a variety of hedge magic techniques that Caiaphas adapted to the hunting of vampires. Additionally, he possesses true faith, far and away greater than even some saints. But the reason for his longevity is his infrequent use of vampire blood 
to prolong his life. The necessity galls him, but he cannot rest until all vampires are dead. Due to said infrequency of his supply and use of Vita, Caiaphas Smith, by the late 1990s, appeared to be an exceptionally vital man in his early 70s, who was easily faster and stronger than a man 20 years younger than that. His reputation among vampires is so fearsome that, in a rare instance of unity, the Camarilla Justicars issued a joint edict. On pain of final death, no kindred is to confront or even interact with Caiaphas Smith. Any prince who fails to enforce this edict is also subject to final death at the hands of the Justicars or their Archons. Their reasoning is that since Caiaphas Smith is reliant on the blood of vampires and has exceeded his human lifespan, he will die of old age if denied Vita for approximately 20 years, demonstrating that a vampire's greatest weapon against mortal enemies is time itself. Number 2. Anezka Anezka was a sister of the convent of the Knights of the Red Cross in Prague near the end of the 12th century. In approximately 1194, a French crusader of the Sword Brethren was brought to the convent to either recover or die peacefully. This warrior was Christophe Romuald, the man who would alter Anezka's destiny forever. As a young woman, Anezka's sole wish was to serve God, to live a pious life, and spend eternity in heaven, continuing her devotion to her creator forever. Christophe was near death, but Anezka cared for his wounds until finally the knight recovered. From the start, they were infatuated and tormented by each other. Their vows meant that their desire could never come to pass, as she was bound to the convent and he to the sword brethren. After Christoph slew the Zemitsi Azra the Unliving, he gave her an amulet of St. Jude, the patron saint of lost causes, that he recovered from Azra's lair in the Bond Silver Mines. That same night, revenants of the Premisil dynasty, the ruling family of Prague in service to Clan Zemitsi, launched an attack on the convent in revenge for Azra's death. But the revenants in Schlachta were held at bay by the strength of Anezka's faith until Christoph could slay them all. After a day of wandering the streets, Christoph returned to the convent, having finally mustered the courage to confess his love for Anezka. She admitted that she felt the same way for him from the moment she saw him, but they knew that their love could never be. Christoph despaired at the cruelty of their fate, but Anezka remembered the amulet of St. Jude and told him that perhaps the saint would find a way, even if there was no way, for them to be together. Anesca bid him stay in the convent that night and avoid the dangers of the creatures still stalking the streets of Prague. But Christoph confessed that if he did, he would be sorely tempted to know Anesca, in the biblical sense, that a man knows a woman. Rather than tempt himself and Anesca with their mutual lust, Christoph fled into the night streets of Prague, where Ekaterina the Wise would find him and make him into her child. Some time later, Christoph returned to the convent as a vampire, following his destruction of the treacherous Cappadocian Mercurio. Christoph, believing himself to be beyond all hope and redemption, revealed what he had become and told Anesca to forget about him. Yet in spite of Christoph's admonitions and despondence at becoming a vampire, Anesca would not give up on saving his soul. So Christoph's redemption became the guiding light of her existence, a purity and a mania that drove her from the convent and into the world of darkness. She hunted for a means by which a vampire could become mortal again. The Tremere, Arden of Golden Lane, sent Anesca to the Zemitsi and ideally to her death, but she returned protected by the power of her faith. The Primacils told Anesca of Golconda, the path by which a vampire's mortality could be reclaimed. Anesca then journeyed from Prague to Vienna to learn more of Golconda from the Tremere Etrius. However, the slave caravan carrying her was attacked by Clan Zemitsi, and she was carried off to Castle Vicerod and to the true master of the Premisils, the Methuselah Vukudlak. Vukudlak, who drew his power from corrupting purity, saw in Anesca a boundless font of purity for him to defile for his purposes. She was given his blood and made into his ghoul. She was seemingly overwhelmed by the power of Vukudlak's Vita and joined in the Zemitsi's plan to resurrect him. Yet, as Vicerod Castle collapsed around them, Kristoff shielded Aneska from a collapsing wall with his body. 
Believing Kristoff dead beneath the ruins of Visorod, Aneska survived, though her existence was one of torment as she was bound to serve the fiend Vukadlok, to be defiled and to defile others in his name. Yet she steadfastly refused to give up hope that somehow someone would come who could defeat Vukadlok. In time, Aneska became Vukadlok's most favored servant, even as she stymied and frustrated his attempts to break the curse that held him in torpor. For as powerful as Vukadlok was, he was an arrogant and fearful vampire, and Aneska exploited these flaws for centuries. She accused Vukadlok's most competent servants of ambition and treachery, leading to the destruction of the Premisil family, and elevated those who were weak and foolish, like the Ventru merchant Orsi. Aneska oversaw Vukadlok's costly and time-consuming move of his Cathedral of Flesh from Prague to New York slowing the operation as much as she could. But the rising tide of fear and anger in the world with the approach of the new century fed Vukadlok until his resurrection could not be stopped. But Aneska learned that Kristoff Romwald had not been destroyed by the fall of Visorod Castle, but rather entered into torpor and in 1999 had fallen into the hands of the Society of Leopold. Using the substantial power of the fiend's blood, she awakened Kristoff from torpor hoping, against all hope once more, that he would come to New York and stop Vukadlok. While seeking to escape from the bowels of the Cathedral of Flesh, Kristoff learned of Aneska's feigned submission to Vukadlok and her centuries of suffering at his hands. As Aneska imprinted her true memories within its walls, hidden where the fiend would not think to look. After Kristoff and his modern coterie sent Vukadlok to final death, Aneska was at last at peace though she feared for her soul. Kristoff told Aneska that her hope and love had redeemed him across the centuries and maintained his humanity. And in the ruins of the Cathedral of Flesh, Kristoff embraced Aneska. Number one, Prius. One of the oldest ghouls in existence, Prius was the most beautiful man of his age and probably a few others. But when he met Helena, he knew that she was meant for him, and he for her. But Helena's beauty had drawn the attention of another suitor, the Toreador Methuselah, Minos. Prius and Helena fled from her betrothed king, and for ten years they were happy. Then Minos found them. Prius did everything a warrior could to defend the woman he loved, but against a vampire of ancient blood, he may as well have been a fly trying to fight an elephant. Minos left Prius for dead, and abducted Helena to take as his bride and child. Prius' surviving relatives secreted him to Egypt, where he spent several years in recovery. After he rebuilt his strength and recruited a band of warriors to aid him, Prius launched an attack on the city of Argos to take back Helena. Following a terrible battle, Prius managed to drive his spear through Mino's heart, paralyzing him. And at that moment, Helena sprang forth to attack Minos, drained him of his blood, and consumed his soul. After the couple left Argus, Helena offered Prius the embrace. He loved her as truly as he ever had, but the thought of becoming a vampire horrified him. Helena, though long dead, did not want to lose Prius or force the embrace upon him, so she offered him her blood to become her ghoul and continue living a semblance of mortal life. As Helena would feed on mortals and later vampires, Prius would then feed from her. And her blood made him strong, stronger than many vampires of higher generation than his love and regnant. And the more he drank from her, the more his love for her grew. Of course, Helena knew better. Her sire had taught her just how cruelly the blood bond could be used, and she endeavored not to abuse her control over Prius, at least at first. Carthage changed things. Helena believed that the Brugia would dominate the world, and she wanted her piece of the pie. Prius, out of concern for Helena's safety, urged her to stay neutral in the ever-growing conflict between the Carthaginian Brugia and the Roman Ventru. Helena used the power of their blood bond to compel Prius to slay her enemies during the day. But when the tide of war turned against Carthage, Helena turned with it and betrayed the city to the Ventru and Malkavians in exchange for amnesty and domain. The Ventru rewarded her treachery with the town of Pompeii in Campania. 
However, her actions also earned her the ire of the Bruja Methuselah, Menele, who unleashed a spirit of fire that caused the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. This was the beginning of the War of Ages between Helena and Menele that saw the two Methuselahs alternate between being the hunter and the hunted, and span continents. The last physical confrontation between the two took place outside of Fort Dearborn in 1812. Prius carried his torpid mistress away from the fight and concealed her beneath Fort Dearborn, guarding her and supplying her with the Vita of destroyed kindred to speed her recovery. To further aid her, Prius went on hunting expeditions across America to slay vampires and claim their blood. However, as he stopped feeding from Helena, her blood bond over him weakened, and for the first time in 3,000 years, he saw the woman he had once loved with clear eyes. He vowed to never again feed from her so that he could maintain his long-lost free will. Instead, he fed only from those kindred he destroyed personally. Since then, he took great pains to conceal that the bond between he and Helena was broken. However, even without the bond, he looks at Helena and sees the woman he has loved for three millennia, even though he also feels that she betrayed and used him. For that reason alone, he still obeyed her. Prius collaborated with the smuggler Brennan Thornhill to buy an old warehouse on State Street, built directly over Helena's resting place, and convert it into the hottest nightclub in Chicago, the Succubus Club. This would serve as Helena's base of operations when she rose from torpor. When the Succubus Club was attacked by werewolves in 1993, Prius fought against the combined forces of the Ghetto Fenris and the Black Furies to ensure Helena's escape. Prius died at the claws of the only lupine to survive the attack, a black fury who remembered Helena and Prius from one of her past lives and slew the ghoul before succumbing to her wounds. But Prius died happy. Helena was safe, and it had been, in that last moment, his choice alone to protect her one final time. And those were the top ten ghouls of Vampire the Masquerade. Ghouls are typically supporting cast in Vampire, and not because ghouls can't be interesting characters, but because, hey, vampires. But what makes ghouls interesting is that, unless they are some psychopathic Zemitsi revenant or some boring blood slave, aka furniture with a pulse, ghouls are forced to have a foot in both the world of mortals and the world of vampires. They have to successfully interact with mortals without giving away who they actually serve, or doing anything potentially masquerade-breaking themselves, while keeping the immortal predator that they depend on sufficiently pleased with their service. For some ghouls, especially in clans like Tremere, Zamitsi, Asamite, and Giovanni, being a ghoul is kind of like an extended job interview, say, a few decades, to see if you have what it takes to walk with the predators and not get eaten yourself. I think ghouls have a lot of solid storytelling potential both as allies and enemies of vampires. Anyway, that's all I have. Until next time. Oh, I was just kidding. I was pretty happy with this project, so I decided to give you all one extra ghoul, just because I was feeling the magic while making this video. And in case the algorithm busts me, I can re-edit this relatively quickly. So. Here we go. Number 11, Heather Poe. The fledgling vampire who is believed to be responsible for the downfall of Prince Sebastian LaCroix of Los Angeles had a number of allies in his or her spectacular adventure. One of these was an association first created from a moment of curious compassion. While in Santa Monica, on the first of several suicide missions assigned by Prince LaCroix to the fledgling, he or she encountered a young woman named Heather Poe bleeding to death in a local medical clinic. Like the fledgling, Heather was a stranger in a strange land, a struggling fashion design student whose parents had died a year earlier in a car accident. Using his or her newly acquired knowledge about the healing and anti-aging properties of canine blood, the fledgling made a decision with dangerous consequences and fed their Vita to Heather. Thinking the matter done, the fledgling left Heather in the clinic, alive and whole. But there was something the fledgling hadn't counted on, the blood bond. The blood bond can affect the minds of those who feed from a vampire, producing feelings of admiration, love, and even dependence. A few nights after their encounter in Santa Monica, Heather managed to track the fledgling to Venture Tower and express her gratitude for saving her, 
and also offered to help in any way she could. How much of this was her own genuine feeling as opposed to the vagaries of the blood of Cain is unclear. The rumor mongers of the Toreador, Nosferatu, Malkavians, and Setites contradict each other as to whether the fledgling accepted or rejected Heather's service. Supposedly there is footage of a red-haired woman meandering around one of the fledgling's newly acquired havens in Los Angeles. If Heather Poe remained as the fledgling's ghoul, it was likely a learning experience for both Domitor and Thrall. Given how quickly the blood bond compelled Heather to seek out the fledgling, she very likely had a psychological need, a need for purpose, for protection, and for love that was only enhanced by the fledgling's potent blood coursing through her veins. She was eager to please the fledgling, offering him or her money, gifts, and even her own blood as tokens of her love and devotion. It is even rumored that Heather Poe lured a man named McFly to the fledgling's haven for him or her to feed on. How the fledgling regarded Heather is subject to speculation. Perhaps the fledgling thought of Heather as a friend, the only one that the fledgling could trust in a world steeped in treachery. Perhaps the fledgling, in the abnormal possessive manner of vampires, cherished Heather as one might a favorite pet. Or perhaps the fledgling fully embraced the dominance of vampires over mortals and their ghouls and treated Heather Poe as a blood-bound slave, to be used in whatever way the fledgling saw fit, and then discarded once her use had run out. The final fate of Heather Poe after 2004 is unknown. The common gossip of Los Angeles was that Heather Poe was kidnapped and then murdered by the Sabbat as revenge for the fledgling's destruction of a Sabbat-controlled warehouse in Santa Monica and the Zemitsi Archbishop's personal haven in Hollywood. If indeed this was Heather Poe's fate, it was a fatal error on the Sabbat's part, as none of them survived the fledgling's wrath. For the fledgling, it would be a painful lesson in the brutality of the Jihad, that if your enemies cannot touch you directly, they will destroy whatever you depend on or care for until you achieve that horrible moment of clarity that the safest way to endure the passage of ages is to care for nothing and no one rather than suffer the pain of loss. But others who have investigated the events surrounding the Ankaran sarcophagus have reported seeing Heather Poe or someone bearing a strong resemblance to her alive and well but with no knowledge of anything having to do with vampires.